There, how's that? All right, that's better. All right, so we have video and we have uh, audio. And you should be hearing me now. So send me a chat or something that tells me that you can hear me fine and that the audio levels are good. All right, we got four people on now. So we'll wait just a few more minutes. Before I get started, I'd like to thank everyone that's here. Um, I do want to kind of keep these right on time and you know a lot of streamers have go through this thing where they have a couple minutes where they have to get synchronized and wait for people to join which is fine so I'll wait around a minute it's going to be an interesting evening if you've seen my other uh, TikToks then uh, you kind of know what's in store and this is um, this is about the same so I don't know who's here um, it's, yeah, we're looking pretty good, I guess. We will start here in one minute. And I will mess around with something else over here that I tried to get going. That, of course, would not get going. First of all, i got to go close the door. crapped out oh great what the what I don't know what's going on there all right let's uh let's go ahead and get started <clears throat> welcome to tech talk with grandpa this is number three and um let me see here we will all right we're over there let me go up here all right this is number three and this is uh my history with using modems and this is everything that occurred um before I got my first cable modem, and we'll talk a little bit about that and how that's evolved since since that time as well in the last 20 years. So uh, first thing we will bring up is uh, this picture here. Let me get over on my slides. This, of course, is a uh, it's IBM. This is the original IBM PC that came out in 1981, and this model number for this one is called a 5150. Uh, consequently, 5150 is also a Van Halen album, not for the same reason, but, but 5150 on the California penal code is, uh, uh, what is it? In need of psychiatric, uh, help, <laughs> but that's not what, that's not what the, uh, I don't think that's what IBM intended, but I'm certainly can tell you that after people used a 5150, that uh yeah they all needed a little bit of help all right so um that the price of a 5150 back in those days was was uh 1565 dollars and that equates to about 4400 dollars today um and i'm going to give you a little quote here now who said uh 640k of ram ought to be enough for anybody anyone anyone Answer, answer what you think the answer is in a live chat. A lot of uh, old timers know who actually said that. And that was set at a microcomputer trade show. And here's your hint in Seattle in, in mid-1981. All right, so on the next, our ne oops, our next slide is, well, it's going to require a little coordination here. Our next slide is, um, the first computer that I really got to use uh, after that Apple II that we had was called a Mac Plus. And when I I, I co-opted IBM in 1984, and we will uh, we'll turn this guy on here. I co-opted 1984 at IBM and then for uh, about eight months, and then I co-opted again at IBM uh, in San Jose in 1980. Yeah, 1986. Right. Um, no, is that right? Whatever. No, I think it's 1985. 
So in 1985, I, I had co-op twice, so I had a little bit of savings. But when I moved back into the house uh, that we affectionately called the Leisure Club, um, my roommate uh, had a Mac Plus, and he also had an image writer. I'll show you an image writer here. So here's an image writer. And that Mac Plus, uh, this guy over here, listed for $2,600. This is 1986 dollars, which equates this almost... $6,200 today, which is a lot of money for a computer. If you look at what you can buy today, um, it's <laughs> it's quite enormous um, cost-wise. And that image writer, which is this one, this was uh, $675 back then, and it was $1,600 today. So those two uh, computing units, which is a Mac Plus and an image writer, was quite a bit setback for a student and he probably my roommate probably got a, a student loan for that and the question is why would you buy something so expensive back then well there was a lot of reasons for it but there were th there were three that I could think of first of all ease of use Macintoshes in the early days is, is probably as well as they are today were extremely easy to use if you compare a Macintosh from back in those days versus a Windows machine, which is probably Windows 3.1, the Mac was years in front of Windows. And um, the next thing you could do on a Macintosh was it had proportional fonts. And so you could, uh, and you had different types of fonts. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that and why, that's, why that was so revolutionary at the time. And then the ability to, to that copy and paste actually actually worked correctly. And I mean work correctly in the fact that you could copy any any item from any program on the Mac side and paste it into any other program. So if you do a if you did a drawing in Mac Paint or Mac Draw, you could paste that into your um, your Mac Write, or if you had Word back then, you could use paste it right into Word. And it it was really extremely simple to use. In effect, I didn't believe how simple it was, but I went to visit my dad in Austin, and he he had a Mac down there, and an older image writer, and I was convinced that it was not that easy to use. So I sat down without any instruction. I figured out how to boot his Mac, and I figured out how to get the word processor going, and then also how to how to type something in and print it, and then I also figured out. Mac draw and and did a drawing and I did the copy and paste thing and after I pasted the drawing into into Mac right um, I knew I was buying a Mac so in comparison to what was available on the Windows side most of the people back at that point were running DOS and um, DOS was uh, <laughs> DOS is a fixed text screen much like what you see here when i type in my my uh my linux uh, command line but uh dos uh, typically you would at that point you'd have this editor called wordstar and wordstar when you printed it everything came out in courier font in one size single size courier font you could do bolding and that type of thing but it was really rather cryptic and being able to put an image into your wordstar document it just wasn't, un it was really unheard of. Okay, so my setup was this one here. So what I ended up getting was was a uh, Mac Plus. And I had, um, I believe I had an external floppy drive. And the, again, that was, uh, oh, the other thing I bought was if you look up there, you'll see that there underneath that floppy drive is a, a Jasmine Direct Drive 20. This was a hard drive. Before this, my roommate only had floppy drives. So you'd boot on a floppy, you would run a word processor on a floppy, and if you had an external hard drive, you could save your word processing documents or drawing documents onto an extra floppy. But floppies at that point were, were kind of slow. So I bought a Jasmine, uh, a, this was a 20 megabyte SCSI drive. And SCSI was an interface that was used um, it's, it's probably still used today on some real high-end machines, but on a Mac, all the Macintoshes had a SCSI connector on the back, and it was a it was a high-speed parallel data bus that went back between peripherals. 
And so typically you put a hard drive on there and you could boot off that hard drive. So if you booted a Mac back then on a floppy, it would probably take, I don't know, a minute or a minute or two, but on a SCSI drive, it would take maybe 15 seconds, <coughs> which is pretty fast. But that printer I showed you printing, uh, the printer, he had a printer, so I didn't want to buy a printer, but we needed to connect them all together. And so Apple had a solution for that on the back of every Macintosh. There was a data port called a, a, a local talk port, and it was on the back of every Mac. It had a local talk port. The printer had a local talk port, and, and in order to network them, so to speak, you had to buy these things from Apple. And this is a, called a local talk connector, and these local talk connectors back then were ninety bucks. This is nineteen eighty six now, which is about two hundred dollars today. And everything you wanted on the network had to have those local talk connectors from Apple and it was, they're kind of it was really nice it was plug and play you just plug it in it just figures out how it works but um, <clears throat> actually electrically that's called it's a 482 signaling on that local talk bus and then that connector was extra fancy in the fact that it had a the uh, the connector itself could determine if you had a cable plugged in or not and if you didn't have a cable plugged in it would do the uh, 422 needs a a termination resistor in order to minimize noise it would auto terminate any kind of network that you had in there and you could put a bunch of devices on there and over that local talk network we could both share the printer and i could share my hard drive with my uh, roommate which was really handy um, but <laughs> we needed three of these things so that was 270 dollars now i'd like to I'd like to mention the fact that um, I'd like to mention the fact that uh, minimum wage back then was three dollars and thirty five cents. So for us to come up with two hundred seventy five dollars or two hundred seventy dollars was was uh, was quite a lot of money. And we needed to buy the cables, which is probably another ten dollars or thirty dollars or whatever it was. It was, it was fairly expensive. So Apple had a solution for that. Well, not Apple, a competitor had a solution for that. It's this thing here. It's called a Farallon um, phone net connector. Now this one here, this is this is a third party uh, connector for local talk. It did the exact same thing that Apple Talk connector did, but it uses regular phone lines instead of that expensive cable. These things were less. These things were twenty five dollars back then, and but they didn't do that auto termination thing. So you had to put this little termination resistor in there which is probably 120 ohm resistor that would plug in but you could use regular connection phone lines and everything we had had these Farallon uh, connectors in them um, oh we got a, we got an answer back from my question so my question was who said that uh, 640k was was enough on the original IBM PC and that of course was Bill Gates and he disputes saying that, but people insisted he did say that. It was an embarrassing quote for him because what do we have now on our machines? This desktop here has 16 gigabytes of memory, which is quite a bit more than 640K. All right, let's move on. Okay, now here, let's, uh, let's go back over here. So um, this was 1986 and... Uh, we were engineering students in, in probably a junior or senior level classes at that point. And we had to, we had homework assignment that required us to log onto the mainframe. And back then, uh, you would, to use the mainframe at NMSU, you had to go to campus and you could use a terminal on campus in the, in the, in an op, in a, um, user room which had maybe 30 terminals in there and if you went in there that place was really stuffy it was full of engineering students who who were were, <laughs> were not very uh, uh they didn't had they had not had a shower recently and uh you had to type in this stuff you log in and type in this stuff well somehow we figured out that the campus also offered dial-up service for mainframe access so we needed, we needed a modem. We, we found out we needed a modem. We didn't know really what a modem was. So we needed one. So on one of the trips home to Los Alamos, 
uh, we, uh, we stopped by salvage, which is a government salvage, uh, yard there in Los Alamos. And we bought one of these. This is an acoustic coupled modem. And this guy here was, uh, a 300, was this, yeah, this was 300 baud modem. And, uh, yeah, 300 baud, you're thinking, wow, that's pretty slow. Well, you know, that's, <laughs> I can't even do the math. What is that? Like, uh, 10,000 times slower than, uh, than your cable modem. So 300 baud, you would do 300 characters per minute. But with this, so we bought this. We didn't know if it worked or not because we got it in the salvage yard. You know, we probably paid a couple bucks for it. Got the cable for it for a Mac. We got a modem cable for a Macintosh. And then we we had to find a phone for this. So our phone at the Leisure Club was one of these, these uh, this was a Western Electric, uh, one of these princess phones that was a dial phone. And this was the phone that we had. Oh, wait, you're not even seeing it. Oh, dang it. All right, let me go back. All right, here's the, oh, shoot, forgot it. Sorry about that. All right, so this is that acoustic coupled modem. And you can see what you would end up doing is you would dial the phone and then you would shove it into, um, you would shove it into, into you take your receiver and you put it in there. And like I said, so we had the modem, we ended up finding a cable or we made a cable or something. And then we brought this back down to uh, where we were going to, we we're going to college and now we needed a phone. So our phone that we had there was one of these princess phones. It was a, it was a dial phone and uh, we had it there. And this, this kind of phone isn't going to work with the coupling of the, of this thing here. All right. So the, um, the, uh, so we needed a phone. So we ended up finding this phone, a phone like this. This is just a, uh, a dial this is called a wall a wall phone and and when i was growing up everyone had a wall phone you mounted a phone on the wall and if you had if you had to talk on the phone you had to be near the phone so we found one of those we mounted it on the wall and then we found some wire and we figured out where the phone service came into the house and we wired this guy up in, in addition to our in addition to our um our, our uh, phone there so what i was going to play here which is unfortunate I can't seem to get it to work now, which is kind of crappy. Um, let me try something else here. Let me see if this is going to work. No, we're not going to get it to work. All right. Well, that's too bad. Well, let me let me wait. wait, wait. Let me let me switch this over to a different microphone. This, I swear, was working when I did this before. But we will try one more time here. All right, that, of course, um, was you would dial the mainframe on campus, you'd dial their phone number and you'd hear those tones and then you would slam that down into the, into the acoustic coupled modem. You know, you'd slam it down into this and then over there on the right hand side, you'd have the carrier light and the, and the carrier light would tell you, um, you know, that you have carrier, which means that you could connect it and then you'd run a terminal emulator on the Macintosh. And you would see the the uh, login banner from the mainframe, and then from there, everything worked exactly like you are on campus. So we, at this point, we were cooking with gas because we could do our homework any time of the day. There was never a line. The phone numbers to call the campus was it was never busy. So um, that was a really a bonus for us to have there at the, at the Leisure Club was to have a modem. All right, so let me uh, go to the next slide here. All right, so that, that was 300 baud. So 300 baud, 300 baud is pretty slow. I mean, you can type, saved you the trip to ride over to campus. You didn't have to sit in a sweaty room, but we wanted something faster. So we ended up finding this thing. This thing here 
We also found this at Salvage. This is a, a Rachel Vedic. This is a 1200 baud modem right here. We found this and at Salvage you'd buy this crap by the pound. This thing was pretty, this thing was fairly expensive, probably $4 because it had a very large uh, wall power supply. And this one uh, had a, you, you, inside of it, you'd have a speaker. So what you'd have to do is you would have to learn how to tell the modem to connect to the, to the uh, campus. And then it would hear that there was touch tone dials or the, the uh, attention tones, and then it would connect up and disconnect the speaker. All right, but now this is a this is a key fa factor. Back in those days, you could you could opt to pay for a service called call waiting. So if you're on the phone a lot, you could uh, your phone would click, and then you would know that someone else is trying to call you, and you could toggle the the hook. It's called toggle the hook, and then you could switch over to a to a different phone call. Call waiting would throw these old modems offline, so you had to learn how to disable call waiting so that you wouldn't get interrupted if you were online. All right, let's uh, let's go over here. Okay, so these are the modem speeds that we had back then. I've highlighted what we had, what we're going to talk about now. So we got a 300 baud modem, 1200 baud modem, uh, 2400 baud modem, a 1488, and 15, 57. This is actually 56K. So if you look at these speeds for us, we basically almost doubled our speed every time we would get a new modem. And that would made it that made it financially acceptable was to um, to uh, fork out the cash for another modem because you know we were students working at three dollars thirty five cents an hour. All right, so um, let's go to the next slide here. Okay, so the the king of the the king of the modem world was Hayes, and Hayes uh, came up with this thing. So smart smart modem. It came out at some point, like probably about 1986 or so. And this guy here was uh, 549 dollars, which is pretty expensive for a modem. Now what Hayes ended up doing was they bought a they bought a modem company, and they uh, had a they bought the patent for this thing called an escape code. So when you were working with modems back then, you had two modes. You had a, um, the first mode was the data mode and the second mode was the command mode. So when you're data mode, if you're connected, anything you type on the t on the keyboard goes over the modem to the receiving side. On the command side, you would type in things like they call it a dial string. You would type in the dial string and uh, when it got connected, it would automatically switch over to data mode. So Hayes had a patent on the, the the ability to switch between data mode and command mode, and it was called the 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 um, escape. It was an escape code, and you would basically stop what you're doing, wait for about two seconds, and then type real fast plus 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 on your keyboard, and it would swap over to command mode. They had a patent on that, so that that made it so all the other modem manufacturers, you know, in order to get around the patent, they couldn't do that. But they did get around a patent by using this thing called time independent escape sequence. And what that did was they took out that window. So in the patent, it says, okay, this R patent says you got to wait for a certain amount of time. You get three pluses and you hop into to command mode. But the other motor manufacturers to get around the patent, they said, there's no, there's no time window to wait. You, anytime you sent plus, 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 it would hop into command mode. And that was such an odd sequence that rarely would you be transmitting data where you would send plus 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 okay but that motor was really expensive and we never had one of those i never had one of those but i did have one of these this is a practical peripherals this is a 2400 baud modem exact you know from my perspective this thing worked fine it was probably a fourth of the price of that Hayes modem and um you know we, we're going from 1200 baud to 2400 baud and this also had higher throughput um, and so this was easier to actually work with. And this was actually one of the first, you know, really acceptable modems to use was that 2400 baud modem. And then from there, uh, I, I, at some point, 14.4 modems became available and I bought one of these. This is also a practical peripheral modem. And I, I used this one almost all the way up uh, uh, through, through when I went to got my graduate degree. All right, so let's keep going. Okay, well, I got the Georgia Tech. Let's go. 
over here. So um, in uh, 1988, uh, I graduated with a master's at, from New Mexico State, and I decided to get my PhD, and I got a really good offer from Georgia Tech, so I packed everything up into the car and moved out to Georgia. And in 1989, after I was kind of had passed this thing called a preliminary exam, which meant that I was I was worthy enough to enter the PhD program, um, I ended up having to buy another computer because I had my Mac Plus back then, and I didn't have a printer, and you know it was just kind of a it's kind of a pain in the ass. But I did have this modem, so I could log in online and check some things over there in 1989. So I decided to buy one of these. This is a Macintosh 2 CX. At the time it came out, and I bought this guy for about 5,400 bucks, which in today's dollars is is more than $11,000 today. And I also bought uh, one of these. This was a 19-inch two-page monitor, they called it. Now, I, this is not the exact one. Um, I couldn't find the exact one, but I bought a Sigma Designs 19-inch monitor, and it was a grayscale monitor that would let me do um was it four bit no it would let me do um it would let me do 256 shades of gray and that monitor was 1800 bucks and then i also bought one of these this is a laser writer this was a 2p and this guy here in order for it to work on a macintosh um in order for this guy to work on a macintosh you had to get that a local talk connector for it but it didn't have that port on it, it only had a parallel port so you'd buy this little kit from HP that included a PostScript cartridge because Apple's back then only, uh, laser printers only worked with PostScript. Uh, most PCs at that point, only they only worked with PCL, but Apple's were using PostScript. That's where they got a lot of their font scaling ability and the quality of the printouts was because they used PostScript. And you'd have to buy this thing here. In addition, this came in the kit. This was a PostScript cartridge. So this PostScript cartridge tells the printer, gives it the ability to interpret PostScript and also some built-in fonts. And you can see these fonts that are here. These are, these are right now, you know, if you install, if most in, um, most uh, operating systems have these fonts installed because this cartridge in the original Macintosh with the original Apple printers had these fonts built into them. The printer and the PostScript cartridge worked out to be 2,400 bucks. So all in all, I paid almost $9,500 for a computer in 1989 for graduate school, which is almost $20,000 today. And uh, let me tell you, I got, I got a lot. I got my use out of that thing. Um, you know, and would I do it again today? No, what, I'm not gonna spend $20,000 on a computer. Well, things have changed, haven't they? Thankfully, they have changed. All right, let's back to this guy. Oh, here we go. So here's here. Uh, if now I it, there was no cable modems back then, yet. So you could get a twenty eight mod twenty eight eight modem, which was you know, where you know, the modem I had previously was fourteen four. So we doubled our speed, and then from there. The next modem was a 56K modem. And then I ended up buying, I think I bought a 56K modem and I had it for probably five years before I got to um, to Boston when I moved in and we had we had a cable, cable internet. All right, so over here, what do we got? Okay, so what could you do online back back then um you know this was this was uh well, i graduated in 93 okay so now netscape went public in 1993 so there, the notion of the http protocol was it, it just didn't exist okay uh, tim berners lee hadn't created it yet but the things you could do throughout the 80s was you could log into a bulletin board so a bulletin board was like a local service that somebody ran and you could transfer files up and down if you got them or created them or there were forums on a bulletin board. But it was, it was local to the town that you were in. Now there were some um, nationwide 
uh, bulletin boards, so to speak. There was CompuServe, and then there was AOL, America Online. And those were some of the early um, bulletin boards. Now, CompuServe, you know, would have, you know, thousands of users from around the country. And when you dialed into CompuServe, um, you would, um, you could access information that CompuServe users posted over there and you could read the news that someone had posted into CompuServe. If you were an AOL subscriber, you could see AOL content from their content providers as well as their, their users. But I never had either CompuServe or AOL. What I did have was in the early days, in the 80s, if you had a modem, you could do this thing called a slip connection. Slip connection is serial line inter, uh, internet protocol, which is basically would put your computer onto the internet at that point. Now, what could you do with the internet? You could telnet to different machines back then. You could also FTP and this other thing called Gopher. Um, we'll talk about Gopher in a future segment here. Um, and slip was the first way, the first was the slip was the first way to put a computer with a modem onto the internet itself. CompuServe and AOL would not be internet compatible at that time. And then SLIP eventually was replaced by PPP. Now, which is, what is, I don't even know what that stands for. <laughs> Something port protocol, I don't know, proprietary? No, I don't know what PPC stands for. But why is PPP important? Is if you get a modem, let's say you're going to do an embedded device and you buy an, you know, a little modem for your embedded device so you can communicate over the data network, wireless data network that, from uh, mobile carriers. Those little modems are actually modems. And if you interface it with your CPU, you have to understand how PPP works because that's how your embedded processor connects to the internet via this modem. So PPP is still uh, relevant today. In fact, uh, a friend of mine was developing something for a, um, uh, what was he doing? Home automation company. And they were using uh, Raspberry Pis with a, with a cellular modem. And he wrote me one day, this is, I don't know, probably five years ago and said, have you ever used PPP? And I started laughing. I said, yeah, like 25 years ago. <laughs> so anyway, um, I don't know if I was able to help him with that or not, but so the reason why I never got on AOL or CompuServe was that I was able to get right on the internet at that point. All right. What's our next slide here? All right. So then I ended up moving to Boston in about 1998 and, uh, we had a cable modem up there that gave us speeds of approximately one megabits per second, which, uh, you know, compared to 56 K was, was, you know, worlds different. And then, uh, three years later, well, probably about two years later, I moved to Uray, Colorado and, um, uh, uh Uray is a tiny, tiny, tiny town in Colorado. And, uh, in the, in the winter months, there's 600 people living there and it's, it's, it's really small, but I picked Uray because they had high speed internet, <laughs> oddly enough. And it was close to an airport and it was close to skiing. So those are, those are my criteria for where I was going to move. So I ended up in URA and I found an apartment right next door to the ISP. So I, I started talking to the, the, uh, the guy that ran the ISP down there. And he said, no, you don't need a modem. You don't need a phone line or anything. I'll just run a ethernet cable out my window and I'll run it into your apartment window. So I was actually connected up to the direct feed on the, uh, on the uh, ISP's uh, internet service. And he actually, at that point, probably had three or four T1s. And so he had a lot of speed on that side. And then and then about six years later, I moved up to where I am now, which is a town a little north of there. And we were able to get co cable modem service, which is, was up to 100 megabits per second. And then recently I ended up moving to, I don't think I have slides for any of this. Okay, so now I'm back. This is my connection that I have now. I got this in the fall. And, um, yeah, I got this in the fall, and now I get uh, close to uh, 
900 megabits per second, which is, you know, the giga, gigabit speed. And I get that on the upload and the download, which is, which is great because most cable modems are, are um, symmetric. So you have fast downloads, but slow uploads. All right, but now I'm I'm at a, I'm at a gigabit speed. Okay, now what are we doing? What are we doing for our demonstration this evening? I am going to switch over to the other camera. How long have we been going here? What are we at? I can't tell. Where is our? How long How long have we been here? Forty minutes. Whoa, wow. All right, let's get to it. I'm going to switch over to my bench camera and my bench microphone. And have you guys been able to hear me? Oh yeah, you've been able to hear me. Okay, I'm going to switch to the microphone and the microphone over there and the camera over there, and we're going to do a little bit of well, we're going to call it unboxing. So <laughs> let's do this. We'll switch to this guy. This is my bench camera, and I'll turn off this microphone here, so you should be able to hear me. All right. And I will put this guy back on here. Okay. Here we go. I have a box here. Ugh, very heavy. And uh, we'll zoom out here. And this box is from my first startup company called Wireless Scientific. Shout out to a friend of mine in uh, Jacksonville. And we're going to open this box up. Now I guarantee you, I have not... See here, can you see me? I, I have not opened this box in at least, I don't know, 20, probably 25 years. What do we got in here? Let me, uh, let me do one thing over here so I can see what we're doing. Okay, what do we got here? We got some of these things. These are removable hard drives. Okay, this is a, uh, how big is this? 44 megabyte removable hard drive. And this was, this was uh, called a Sequest drive. And in order for a Sequest drive to, to uh, be able to read, you had to have one of these Sequest drive controllers, or uh, it's a drive. It's like a like a CD-ROM drive, but these guys are read-write, which is good. Um, and back on the back here is a SCSI connector, and you have this thing over here where you set the SCSI address. You plug this into your SCSI bus, and then you could have removable hard drives. So this box here has a lot of these in it. Then this one's got the system folder. Some of my stuff on here, some of my business stuff. And look at the last date on it was 4-21-1993. Now, does this still work? I don't know. <laughs> we got a bunch of cables. Where was this thing? Oh, here. Here's another gem. An external floppy drive. Probably the first one I bought right here. Kept it. Oh. Yeah, this come in handy, solderless breadboard. All this PageMaker. Here's my serial number for PageMaker right here. All right. Oh, this is PageMaker 5. Well, this is pretty new. And these are Macintosh floppies. Oh, what do you think about that? They also had ATM fonts. That's another thing we didn't talk about. What's in this box? This box. Oh my gosh, floppy drives. Floppy disks. Far side scans. <laughs> oh my gosh. This guy. Oh, Illustrator. I had, a, I had a copy of Illustrator. All right, enough of that. This box here is labeled SCSI. So we open this up. Oh, it's got, what is this thing? Oh, I had optical mice back then. So my mice used, a, they were optical, much like they are today. But in order for them to work, they had to be on one of these glass uh, pads. And But those optical mice never got dirty, and they worked great. 
So if you if you had a Mac back then, if you were doing a lot of work, you'd have to have optical optical mice. And oh look, that postscript cartridge. Here it is, baby. <laughs> this enabled me to do a lot of things back in those days. Was that I was able to plug this into a a laser writer, laser writer 2P, SCSI cables. I don't know what's in the box. Oh, this that's just what this is, SCSI cables. All right. Well, this is <laughs> this box is basically a bunch of junk, really. You're asking, are these valuable? Is any of this valuable? I doubt it. Okay. Here's the thing that's a shocker. We're not going to get it out tonight, but I saw it in here. If we look down in here, I don't know if you can see down in there. Right here is that Macintosh 2CX that I paid in today's dollars $11,000 for. <laughs> it is probably worth, I don't know, 50 bucks now. Probably worth about fifty dollars. All right. Well, that's not what I was going to show you. Oh, we got to put our we got to put our edition of PageMaker back because I have a serial. I don't know if you can get PageMaker. I think it got rolled into a, a Dilla, uh, Adobe Illust Adobe uh, Creative Suite. Now can open up some of those files. All right. Here's what I was going to show you right here. This guy right here. This is my laptop bag from 1992. And you can see that it uh, comes complete. Let me zoom in here. It comes complete with cobwebs. Would you look at this bad boy? This thing weighs a ton. Let's see what's in here. All right. So we will open up. What do we got here? We have. These bags were fancy back then. Right, we got this guy. I got a couple of floppies in here. I don't know what that is. Nothing in here. Got power cords over here. What's in the next one? Back in those days, if you wanted a quality bag, you had to go with the, the Kensington name. Alright, let's go in here. I know what's in here, because I knew what was what it was. Ah, look at this bad boy. <laughs> look at this bad boy. This here is my PowerBook Duo 230. All right. And then over here, I have a power adapter for it. Awesome. And this looks like a printer cable. Or keyboard cable or something. All right. What's in our next big thing here? All right, what's in this end one? Oh, look at this guy. Oh, check this out. This one lets me run my my duo off a of cigarette lighter. At some point I had a portable printer from HP that I could plug into this thing and it would work. Oh my gosh, would you look at what's in here? You are going, this is a special treat for you all tonight. This here is a dock. This is a mini dock for the Duo. So you, you, you come home and you plug it in here and then back on the back here, you had uh, you could run a uh, a monitor. No, that's a SCSI. That's a SCSI connector. You could run a monitor. This is probably a VGA monitor. Several ports, and this is for looks like an external floppy drive, microphone, speaker, and I know for sure that this thing. I'll tell you about a little bit more about this one in the future. But it looks like my my dock here. I had a newer mini dock. Now, what did that give you? That gave you Ethernet, and you could uh, run an extra, um, I don't know, mouse or or um, keyboard off of this. Now I do, you know, look at these guys. Here are the feet. These feet would fold down, 
and it would expose a port underneath the foot. So you're like, that's kind of cool. All right. So you have two ports. Oh, look, this has got a modem in it. This is a modem, which is probably a 38.8 modem. No, this is probably a 28.8 modem that's inside of here. That's not the tr that's not the treat. What's this thing? What is this thing? Oh, look, it's another it's another floppy drive for looks like that computer because it got this huge ass connector on it. All right, that's for the dock. And I have a PowerBook power adapter here. Wall work. And look at this bad boy. I did not know where this guy was. This is my first digital camera. It's Let's zoom in on this thing. This is called a Quick Take 100. And this was the first digital camera that Apple came out with. Is that in focus? Hold on a minute. All right, this guy here. Yeah, this is a Quick Take 100. I don't, I don't know the specs on this yet, but I, you know, you had to you know, shoot through here, get over here. You, this is the viewfinder. Had a flash. Here's your viewfinder. You hold it like this and hold it up to your, and then you transfer it using uh, local talk again. Your local talk connector here. And you could power it over here, and you could also charge it off of this side. Uh, there was no... Wait, what is in this side? Oh, you could put regular batteries in your quick take. Oh, so this one is probably a... This side's probably a power thing, so you could run it on an adapter, but you could also run it on the batteries. And the resolution of this thing was probably a screen in 128 by... I don't know... 84 or something. All right, that's that's a this is a gem here. This one is a gem. The the duo itself. Let's go back out here. The duo itself is probably you know I don't know because I got so much stuff. This is all. I should probably donate this to a museum or something. I don't know what all this stuff is. More more crap. All right, here we go. Let's uh, let's go from here, and we need the power cable for that little adapter. This is the portable power cable that you would carry around with you because it had this wind-up cord thing. Apple has always been kind of fancy when they did all this stuff. They learned that from the very first uh, Macintosh. Um, it also has uh, one of these IEC connectors, so I have one over here. I'll just pull it in here. And what's this thing supposed to output? This thing is supposed to output uh, 24 volts at one, at one amp? Yeah, one amp, right here. 24 volts at one amp. It's got this connector on here. Now I, <laughs> a wise man would would uh, check this power adapter before we <laughs> would check the output of this before we looked at anything but we're not too wise all right this guy here this is the let's open this guy up all right so down here you have this little tiny screen oops get back on there you have this little tiny screen and I think the resolution of the screen was 640 by 400 and it was a grayscale screen and it would do 4 bit grayscale so it would it would do uh, 16 colors at 4 bits and I bought this guy in 1992 for what do I got here I bought it for 2600 bucks in 1992 and it that in today's dollars about 4800 dollars today so that's oh, great what's going on here Oh my! The, oh my! My my feet have deteriorated. And it's leaving black spots on my. That's not good. Hold on a minute. That's pretty good, actually. 
All right, let's uh, put this down. I don't want to ruin my, my fine bench here. Okay, what else? This thing had a, uh, this thing had a 68, 68,000 processor, the 030 module, model. And uh, it, this one ran at 33 megahertz and its memory was is four, meg, four megs of memory. It did not have a FPU in it. Uh, however, this little mini dock right here, I believe has an FPU in it somehow. And then also when I was looking through my stuff, I saw that this had the, if you look up on the internet, look up these duos, they also had a big dock where they would kind of slide into a dock that wasn't like a mini dock. And I, for some reason I have one of those as well. So I have the, uh, the plethora of Apple duo documents. Uh, uh, products, actually. I have pretty much everything right here. All right. Are you ready? Let's see if she boots. Now I guarantee you, I guarantee you, I swear, I have not tried this before. I don't know if it's gonna work. I don't know. This is, this is a new thing. Now what's going on? What could be a fault? What could be a fault here? What well, could be this guy? Okay, the power adapter doesn't work. Uh, it could be something wrong with the electronics in here. It could be that the hard drive inside here, these are spinning hard drives, that the uh, the head lubrication is stuck. Um, we're just gonna have to try it. All right, so let's plug her in here. What do we do here? Okay. Plug her in. Ah, it's like an archaeology. Oh my God! Did you hear that? Ha <laughs> ha! Is it gonna work? Uh oh! Screen came on. Oh, the hard drive is spinning. <laughs> Oh, would you look at that? Oh, it's really dim. It's really dim. Hold on, let me show you. <laughs> yes! Something's going on here. Let me get rid of that guy. What do we got here? Macintosh starting up. I can't believe it. I cannot believe it. You hear the hard drive playing? <laughs> this is awesome. It's unfortunate that the screen is so dim. But if we connected this up to an external monitor, this guy'd work fine. Now what I pulled out here was this this uh you could put these removable things in the front of this thing. You could put an extra battery, and I think that this side is the battery itself. And I don't think this side comes out, but this side is removable. This side over here is removable, and you could put in extra drives, or you could put in uh, more batteries or whatever. I don't think I have. I probably have one of that somewhere. We'll never know. Oh, look at this thing. Let me see if I can get this to be a little zoomed in for you guys. I wonder if I can see it, too. All right, that's as far as this camera zooms. Okay, I can kind of see what I'm doing. What do we got here? I'm gonna tip this up a little bit so I can see what we're doing. Okay, we got uh, system folder. Oh, let's go over and look at about this Macintosh. Can't believe this thing is working. Holy cow, this thing has 12 megs of memory in it. I guess I put the extra memory in it. This set up 7.2. 5.3 and uh, uh, the system is using 7k of no 7 megs of memory well, would you look at that what else is on here road files applications what do we got on here this is what's on the hard drive Z term all this page maker word BB light BB edit light was an editor a quick take, I could take some pictures with that camera. I might do that later. Hypercard 2.1. TK Solver. We're going to talk a little bit more about TK Solver in a future episode. Claire Straw. 
At some point, Apple spun off all their software stuff to a company called Claris, and Claris Draw became, or Mac Draw and Mac Write became Claris Write and Claris Draw. GTEL Records, I don't know what that is. Downloads. Oh my gosh. Puzzle.jpg. Oh, look, I have a PDF document in there. I don't have a PDF viewer. What about this guy? I don't have a way to open up. I don't know why these are on here. Anyway, well, this is all working. Oh, look, there's a picture of the sex machine on here. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. This is not good. Hell. <laughs> Oh, I took a picture with it. Okay, we had a we had a van uh, that we that was an old van that got, kind of got donated to my roommate, and um, it was a rusted old Chevy piece of junk van, and we call it the sex machine only because it was never going to see any. Okay, there's some. It looks like there's a word document on here. Uh, uh, some compactor files, plots. I don't know. It's it's actually exciting. Now what what are icons on the desktop? We got Z term down here. We'll talk about Z term and after you know not today, but Netscape Navigator 2.02. Wow, this is great. Intelnet, like I told you, Intelnet. Well, I am happy as a clam here. Um. Oh, look at this. It is working. That's as bright as she goes. This is just awesome. This is this is great. <laughs> All right, let's uh, let's be kind to this old Mac and shut her down. Let's put her down. And there we go. Well, for those of you who have made it this far, uh, yeah, we're done. I think we're done with our slides. Yeah, we're done. For those of you who made it this far, I'm sure it was a treat. I don't know if you've ever seen a Macintosh Power Duo, let alone C1 Boot, after it's been in that computer bag for, I guarantee you, 25 years. That's it for tonight's episode of Tech Talk with Grandpa. Join me next week, and we will pick it up again then. All right. See you then.